All right. Uh, welcome to my live stream. <laughs> um, oh, you know what? I should take this ridiculously sized thing off. Okay. Let me take this giant banner off. While you're doing that, people can just hear the the Cintiq sounds of me drawing hashing lines. I like it. It's it's like a ASMR for people. Yep. Uh, let's see. How many ASMR jokes have we told in the last like? Quite a few. I feel like we've been on a roll. Yeah. There. Yeah. At one point in time, not I came late to a stream. I remember this one. Not knowing <laughs> that somebody. Had expressed like, oh, I can't do it with the eating, <laughs> you know, it, it was like an actual physical thing for him. And I didn't know that. It's that was funny. hilarious, though. I think yeah. the fact that you weren't in the know made it very funny, because um, you just like shoved like a um, a Snicker bar, like just. I think I yeah, I think I grabbed a bag of sun chips and started. Oh yeah, just, just <laughs> you know. Um. <laughs> All right, so I should explain what this is for people who are tuning in, as I've heard we're supposed to do with live streams, and I always do what you're supposed to do. Yeah, <laughs> like have a giant banner. Josh, he's mm -hmm. always doing what he's supposed to. Yes, I am a rule follower, you guys. Um, but anyhow, so uh, this is the live stream where I usually work on comics, and then uh. Corey and I like will be doing alternating live streams every once in a while. So if we do another live stream, it'll be on Corey's channel. Uh, but we also just finished doing art casters. And uh, I realized like at first my inclination was like, no, 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 I'm not going to work more on comics. I'm going to get some sleep because I have a long day tomorrow. And then I remembered I have two graphic novels that I have to finish in two years. So <laughs> I was like, you know what company and like that extra um, motivation to kind of get it done. Well, yeah, let's do a live stream. So anyhow, uh, I'm a graphic designer, illustrator. I've done that for like 15 years. And now I've been an art director for uh, over seven. Corey has taught. Um, uh, how long have you taught creatively? Now? Uh, like, eight years in December. Okay. So he teaches like design courses and stuff like that uh, for eight years. So about as long as I've been art directing, he's been teaching. So and that, uh, and before well, that, Corey, he was creative directing. Well, why don't you introduce yourself, Corey? Sorry. <laughs> no, that's good. But that story that you were just telling, uh, that was Adam. He said, I'm glad you didn't do that on purpose. That was an extremely unpleasant experience. I apologize. I had no idea. I yeah, just, and uh, Adam, I, I don't want to say I wasn't laughing at your expense. It's just there was really insane comedic timing to what he did. And oh, I man. think the cluelessness of it made it kind of yeah. funny but i did kind of feel bad <laughs> although i will say adam didn't you just recently post a video of you playing a song with a carrot because uh people should check that out on adam's um channel oh that sounds interesting um yeah so you can i yeah i've done a lot of different things in my career and uh you can find all that not all that stuff but all the stuff i still care about at coreycur.com Cool. So anyhow, what we what I usually work on during these live streams is um, I'll be working on book two of two stories. And you might find that there might be another book um, that I'm going to be working on a lot. And that I may not be able to show as much of. I'm not quite sure till the contract's completely ironed out. But uh, but we're really close on that. So um, so that's pretty much the stuff I'll be doing on these things. If you're curious about my work, you can uh, pick up a copy of Two Stories, book one on Amazon if you haven't for like a really reduced rate, or if you don't feel comfortable supporting the Megalith, then um, then you can uh, just you know request it from your local bookstore. And then also you can check out uh, Jacob's Apartment, which is my graphic novel that is coming out in May of 2022. Um, and that basically this is just a live stream where we hang out we draw and work on that stuff you should also make sure you go to cory uh, uh and check out what's new um and then he's going to come up with a uh eventually a drop that has tom jones that gets us demonetized <laughs> every time we say that but anyhow 
Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically, uh, what this thing is. And so we're going to hang out and if you guys have questions, oh yeah, I'm supposed to say this at the top. We didn't own our casters, but this is my channel now. So yeah, we didn't do say it, it with my channel. We'll do it with on your channel. <laughs> <laughs> we should be saying this on every channel, but, uh, but yeah, we take super chats. So, um, if you guys like want to support what we're doing or anything like that, hit us with a super chat. I will read whatever you say within the super chat as long as it's not inflammatory or rude about anyone um maybe at my expense i might read stuff that's like that you know is insulting to me <laughs> just maybe not to other people um because <laughs> i got a thick skin but yeah make sure it's safe for work kind of stuff that won't get us demonetized and, and uh yeah we feel free to drop a super chat if you enjoy uh and so that is the very obnoxious stuff we had to get out of the way at the top and now now let's get into a deep, interesting conversation, Corey. You're going to kick it off with the most interesting. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't here's, like, here's, I'm, my, here's my deep, interesting conversation. I need to finish this piece in this hour. That's nice. My, because immediately after the stream, I am uh, I'm shutting this computer down and packing it up to travel 1,200 miles. Are you really like it's that quick that soon? Uh, yeah, Tuesday, dude. Very cool. Um, you know, what's funny is my wife is going to be going on a trip in a different direction where she'll be going to Utah to visit family. So you guys will drive right, right past each other, right past each other. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I have uh, so if you some... happen to see like mine and Ben on the road, you know, because it's oh, one road. <laughs> I have a 17 hour drive with three children. One of them oh my is goodness. seven months old. So that'll be fun. <laughs> Dude, uh, you you are a, a braver man than I am. Um, but dude, that's cool. That's exciting that it's happening that soon. Is yeah. there... So I'm feeling this lately, and maybe this will be an interesting kind of take. And by the way, I'm, I'm thinking about an hour or two. I just want to knock out as many panels as I, as I can in an hour. Yeah. Um, uh, so I have this thing where, um, I really was excited about this new contract that's coming up, but it's like a 200 and something page graphic novel. Yeah. And, uh, I got two years on it, you know? Right. And then I'm already on one that's 130 that I'm trying to finish in a year. And I had this brief moment of like, being really thankful, really excited, and then complete and utter panic <laughs> at the thought. But also just realizing, um, you know, because you've been through grad school too, so you know how that goes. It's like, that's kind of how uh, grad school kind of goes too. Um, oh, Eva asked uh, in the chats, what you drawing? I am drawing a, just something totally normal. Um, a camera with uh, tentacles exploding out of the, the film casing. Yeah, as um, you see, you yeah, know. Yeah, at, as at you a, do. Yeah, typical camera store. You go mm. in, there's, a, you know, your tentacle camera. Right. Um, I, uh, I, am, I am, what I'm doing is I'm doing, um, uh, what am I, it's a, uh, how do I describe this? I'm, oh, I'm just doing it. That's why it's late. I'm doing a series of faces. And so I'm trying to draw as many faces as I can. Um, but I'm trying to, yeah. Just, who hasn't, who hasn't been there? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and we got Philip Chandler, Adam and Frank in the chats as well. How you guys Hi doing? Philip. How you doing, man? Uh, we're doing good. We were just talking about uh, utter panic over stuff. Sorry. Go ahead. But yeah, no, I am. Um, oh, what was I saying? Oh, I, I wanted to do just faces, but I also hate boring things and doing things in a conventional way. And so um, my faces are just weird faces. So I've got, um, you know, some normal looking stuff, but I try to do something interesting with it. And then I'll do like insects or, you know, some sort of mutant or something. And so you guys can see all of that at, on my Instagram channel. If you nice. See, like how this goes into the series and uh frank our mod uh just hopped in and said curve face 
which I think is great. Um, uh, yeah, so um, I am working on two stories, book two, page... Uh, I, it's weird because like on Instagram, I've been posting the pages, but technically I've been posting the wrong ones because I'm at, I think I'm on like page 11 or something. So oh. <laughs> um, I am working on pencils for that. And then, uh, yeah, I was just it, like kind of bringing up to Corey, like that there's this weird thing where like, like when you get an opportunity in art, like, like what you're doing too, the sabbatical, I want, I'm curious about this, but it's like, it's a very ambitious thing you're kind of setting out to do. Yeah. Um, and yet like you got it greenlit, so you're okay to do it. I had that moment with like, with the, with the, you know, just like, uh, it's like a moment of like thankfulness and panic at the same time. Right. When I was like, I, I think I can do this, but it really is like, crazy <laughs> mm -hmm. um so yeah i don't know i was just kind of curious like if you've gotten that with this project and then also like how i mean because obviously as a creative you got to be familiar with that if you have had it um and then how you kind of override that and kind of decide to like allow like an opportunity to happen because opportunities always have work you know like i don't know yeah so so one of the so i recently burst a blood vessel in my eye and, and one of the possibilities of that happening is stress. So yeah. I'm not sure why that happened, <laughs> but it is possible that I, cause I don't like consciously recognize stress very often or well. And so it's, it's possible that I'm so stressed out that like, I don't know it. And my body's like, yeah, let's, let's tell you how stressed out you are. Your eye explodes. So that's, that's one option. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, to me, I related that more to probably like the crazy motorcycle accident recently, you know? Yeah, Which is, it's um, possible. I did recently tell my physical therapist that I was unhappy with his service. And that was kind of stressful. Oh, um, yeah. Eva said uh, she overrides it by not thinking about how scared I am. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, for me, it's like, I think it's a healthy fear, like at least in, in a project sense, because as long as it's not debilitating. Yeah. It, yeah. it, it, it depends how you use it. Um, for me, it's like, uh, I did have a brief moment where it could have been really bad, you know, where I had like, and this is like, I, I only noticed it cause it was like a temporary thing and I don't get this a lot, but I remember I sat down, it was like right after the contract actually came in for the second graphic novel. And it was like, well, I, it'll be my third. Um, and I was like, or actually it'll be my fourth by that point. That's so scary. Um, but yeah, I had that moment of like, where you're like get it, catching your breath, but then you catch yourself like, <sighs> you know, like right. um, <laughs> doing the like, okay, okay. Kind of thing. And, uh, and I was doing that for like a good five minutes and I had no idea. And then I realized like, Oh, I'm just like really freaked out about like, like it's just a lot of work. Yeah. But, um, but I had that moment for like five minutes. And then again, like I reminded myself of a few things, like one is that like, it's like a decade of work. Right. Um, I, I think this is really similar to your project too, where it's like, it's kind of the fruition of a lot of hard work, um, and abilities you've gained and things you worked really hard at that are kind of starting to pave a pathway. And so there's an opening and like the last thing you want to do with that, if, if it's something you still desire doing is like not walk through that path. Like when it opens up, like, um, at least for me. And so like that for me kind of helped me deal with like the potential panic of it because it's like, well, it's just got to get done. And I have yeah. to say, yes. I mean, I don't feel forced into saying yes. Mm -hmm. Like I optimistically will say yes, you know, right. but yeah. Yeah, for me, I uh, I usually – it's usually like planning that will help me get out of that, which I hate doing, and I don't naturally – I don't naturally plan. Um, but if I'm like – if I'm freaking myself out, it's usually because I don't have a grip on how it will get done. 
And that doesn't mean like I've taken on something that I can't do, but it's that I've taken on something and I haven't taken the time to like plan out how that will happen. And so as soon as I, as soon as I have that plan, then I'm like, okay, great. Yeah. And then, and then you just work the plan. Like once, and once you get to the point where it's just like, oh yeah, you just work the plan. Yeah. Anytime it becomes stressful or overwhelming, you just check like, are you on track? Yep. And if you are, then you're fine. And if not, then what do you need to reevaluate? And so, yeah, it's usually just until I get my, my ridiculously detailed Trello board done. <laughs> but that's not a bad way to do it either. I mean, because I, again, it's like a warning sign that can be used for good. Like, um, for, you know, for, for me, it was like, just like, I just really, the, the math of it is I just need to like go hard for like two years. <laughs> um, right. But and I have also, my process down, you know? So do you also know like the number of pages that you need to get done or what stages you need to be at at different points in time? Yeah. I mean, with uh, two stories book two, it's a little more rough because I have more flexibility with that. With this, right. I will definitely have a map of what's due and i'm imagining i'm going to be sitting down because this is a much more involved publisher too um, yeah. and also with the new book um it's it's a different writer and so like mm -hmm. we definitely are going to need to iron out details like when the final script needs to be approved right. you know before we go to like roughs and like when roughs will be due and um all of that so um but like you know, for me, it's like right now, until we can even have that conversation, I know just I need to haul rear end on this current book. Because, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, it's just too good of an opportunity to turn down. But it's like, but I, I agree with you, like on the idea of like, um, it, it, yeah, I mean, especially like, well, you you might have picked that up creative directing, right? Um. Just because I, I definitely have that moment a lot. And especially as a young art director, like my first two years doing it, I would have a lot of moments of just like sheer overload. Yeah. And and um and then I just started to learn to just kind of trust the process and and sort of like sit down, stay calm, like analyze the situation, back yeah. plan it, map it out. Like if there's if there's something blocking, you know, a runway the best thing to do is like analyze the runway and find out what that thing is, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, it's a hard thing to kind of get used to doing. Do you do that naturally or is that something you've kind of grown to do? Yeah. I, you know, anytime I take those tests of like, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert or whether you're right brained or left brained or whether you're this or that, I'm always like 51, 49. Like I'm always like riding that line. And so um, like I am one of those rare artists that kind of like enjoys geeking out, like making a nice spreadsheet. Like I kind of really enjoy like a really well-crafted spreadsheet. <laughs> so um, I, I, I don't know if I naturally do it or if I've learned it, but I definitely have a personality type that, that l l lends itself towards kind of a more organized systematic type of thing. Which is, which is interesting because I don't work that way. My, my illustration style is very chaotic. Um, and I like, I intentionally go out of my way to like subvert any process that I, I try to do things differently all the time. And I try to, you know, not on client work, but like I push the boundaries of like the tools that I use and how I like, I don't know, the projects that I do even, I try to change it up. You, so. you have a fan of the spreadsheet thing. Uh, um, Eva said, uh, hell yeah, spreadsheets are fun. So are yeah. databases. You guys are strange people. <laughs> I'm, no. I'm just saying. Have you, not, have you not like set up a spreadsheet with a bunch of like interdependencies and then you like highlight different cells? No. You can change the variables in that cell and like no. it calculates everything for you? No. That's I mean, not fun? Uh, no. Oh, I love it. That's I I, so like, much. that's the thing is like, I, I can do business stuff. Um, and, and I do think that's a really good thing to be able to do, especially talking numbers and understanding overheads and like, 
yeah. you know, budgets and stuff. Like that's a huge thing. Um, and you, I think one would have a really hard time art directing and not being able to do that. Right. Um, cause I do think a lot of art directors end up in a lot of conflict that's unnecessary just because they aren't understanding budget limitations. Um, and like, obviously you want to advocate for great art and stuff like that, but if you can do both, like <laughs> yeah. if you can work in dream and reality, uh, it's a huge thing, but no, like anything with like mathematics, um, anything that's like data entry esque, I, I can't, I just can't enjoy it. However, uh, I am kind of curious too. Eva said, uh, it's always the worst for me when I'm new in a particular skill and I've gotten a job doing it for the first time. Yeah, that that's a, that's a hard, a hard thing. But then again, you do that once or twice. Like I think my first job, I didn't even know Adobe illustrator. And that was primarily, that was my first in-house art job. Um, when I was like fresh out of college, and uh, I didn't really know Adobe Illustrator all that well. And I just sort of claimed that I did. And then I learned very quickly. Um, and like, I think like you do that once or twice and you, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I, I, yeah. wanna, I just want to point out, Frank has found a secret hidden, uh, what do they call those? Easter egg on my website. And so if you, uh, if, if you want to leave me a digital tip, then, then yeah, you can, uh, you can go to uh, my website or you can go to buy me a coffee, uh, dot com slash Corey Kerr. I think I also have a Ko-Fi. I don't know if you pronounce that coffee or Ko-Fi, but, uh, but yeah. Um, Quark Express. Eva, Eva is shouting out Quark Express here. That's, that's some old school stuff, man. There yeah. are very few people that I that I talk to because I teach college, so they're all young, that even have even heard of that. But I remember when the New York Times switched from Quark Express to Adobe InDesign, and it was like an earth-shattering conversation that happened everywhere in communication. <laughs> yeah, like, I dude, um, I remember I knew a couple guys that were specialists in Quark. And oh, did they did they they did refused they, well? they refused to transition. They oh. were just like, no, 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 I'm not like this is never gonna take over Quark. And I remember watching quite a few of them just like go away, age out of the industry in yeah. real time. And they were like maybe like five years ahead of me in, in my career. Yeah. And I was like, I remember just learning a lesson from that or trying to learn a lesson from that, like being like, don't ever dig in your heels. Yeah. Don't just be like, better than everybody. I know oh, this dude, thing. We got Everybody. Jeff in the chats too. The, the original art caster. Um, oh, how's it going, up, Jeff? What you up to buddy? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's always it's always weird when I hear people say I refuse to learn new things. It's like okay, good luck with that. The only person, the only person that has said that to me, and I've been like, I think that's the right choice, is like this world-renowned oil painter <laughs> who taught college, uh, and and was in his he was like seventy three, and he's like, he's like people keep trying to push me to learn Photoshop. And I was like, dude, you, I, I will, I, I might not ever tell anyone else this in my life, but you should not waste your time trying to learn Photoshop. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, you're a 73 year old world renowned oil painter. Yeah. Like, people fly you to Rome to paint murals on their buildings. You shouldn't. Yeah. It, learn Photoshop. There are certain skills too, that are very like, uh, what I was speaking about was more of just like trying to be a practicing commercial artist, you know? Right. Um, yeah. Well, and, and, and it's, in, but it's like it's within the, it's a change within their field. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, like there's also like in, in commercial art, I could see an exception with, um, with like, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking out. Um, oh, no, why? It's like, one of, oh, Milton Glaser, right? Oh, sure. Milton Glaser, if he wants to like hand ink, which I think he did the right. Mad Men promo that he got hired to do. 
like toward the I can't tell if that was you or me. I think it was both of us, man. Uh, did yeah. your screens just go black? You you froze and then both screens went black. Yeah, I had the same thing, and there were like these little swirly bops. So right. that was. Are we back, people in the chat? Can you hear us and tell us that we're still streaming? Yeah, um, yeah. Oh. Let us know if you're still hearing. Yeah, uh, Frank said okay. it was both of you. Right. So that's got to be. I don't know. Maybe we have the same internet provider, and they're crappy. We should. Uh, we should see if Jeff wants to jump on. Jeff, if you want to, let us know. Yeah, dude. If you feel up to it, man, uh, I'll send you a, a Streamyard link. But you know, we're not going to no, be no pressure. Super long. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it'd be fun to catch up too. I haven't talked to. Talked to Jeff in a, well, quite a while. Um, and then Philip was saying, I thought my internet dropped. That's really what happened here, guys, is oh, all of your fault. internet's dropped. It's your no, problem, not Philip. ours. It's just Philip's fault. <laughs> it was Philip's, and then that had a ricochet effect <laughs> right. across the um, series of tubes that is the internet. And, uh, I, oh. yeah. I've confused Sorry. myself on which of these tentacles is in front of which other tentacle. Hold on just a second. That's it's the, the problem with tentacles, man. Those things can be a beast to draw. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see what I... Yeah. <laughs> Have um, you read that book, The Beast? Um, I don't think so. It's yeah. like trying to be Jaws, but with a giant squid. Oh, that sounds pretty awesome. I, You know, that hits me at a spot that I, I don't know if I... I well, maybe you do know this, Corey, because we have known each other for quite a few years yeah. and had some pretty strange conversations. I am obsessed, or I had a period where I was obsessed with, like, colossal squids. Oh, um, really? I don't know that about you. But yeah, I, I was, like, watching documentaries and, like, reading all these articles on it and just was like, this is the coolest thing in the world. Okay, I'm going to look this book up. I think it was actually written by the same author who wrote Jaws. Dude. Um. Jaws book. Uh, let's see. And that was Peter Benchley. Eva said, sorry, Eva said YouTube's been iffy the last couple of days. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's um, called Beast. Beast, okay. Yeah, and I, I will tell you. Is it on audiobook? If it's on Audible, man. Okay, now hold on. Before you do it, you should look up the reviews because – uh, Frank, this is not a, hen a hentai camera at all. Just so you just let's we'll put that one to bed. Frank, right you're you're our mod, man. <laughs> Careful, buddy. <laughs> what our mod is mentioning. <laughs> um, and and Frank is saying, I remember seeing the book The Beast somewhere, uh, and it was it did become a movie. And as a, um. I think I was a teenager when I read it. So that's why I say you should read the reviews sir, first because I can't I can't remember if it was really good or if I enjoyed it because I was like 14. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of don't care right now. I mean, I I, I mean like it it kind of has me at the premise, so I will read the reviews, but I'm probably going to yeah. be all about it. But the movie, the movie was awful. Wait, they made a movie of it? Yes, and it was terrible but is it like good terrible or like bad terrible uh i didn't enjoy it as a teenager i but but i had read the book and the movie came out and i was very excited about the movie and and um so i think probably you know that was just disappointing uh let's see the movie came out <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Eva made a good point. She said it's funny how people mention hentai the moment straight tentacle appears. <laughs> right. Uh, 1996, there was a TV miniseries. So, yeah. Oh, they've got a trailer and everything. My goal in every live stream is just to get Josh demonetized. Um, I, won't, I won't play the trailer, but I don't know. You know, The Beast from 1996... TV movie adaptation of the book that nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> They're probably not going to be super, super harsh on uh, content moderation for that. 
Nah, let's 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 keep it off. I, I want my ten cents. <laughs> this is gonna be an on running joke with me. Is like the second I got monetized, I'm just like, yes, give me the coins. Um, but uh, but no, um, uh, I that does sound fascinating. I, so when did it come out though? The book? No, the movie. The movie came out in 1996. Okay, so it's probably not good, bad then. Because I was like, if it came out in like the 70s or the 60s, like that might be awesomeness. You know? Yeah, the novel the novel was written in 1991. Interesting. Yeah. That's the year that punk broke. Yeah. There's a documentary called 1991, the year punk broke. That like, oh. it's a, it was like a film that Sonic Youth made. And it's hmm. a really fascinating piece of, uh, of like music history because it's like Nirvana on their first tour when they blew up. Uh -huh. And so you actually watch this band that like is, you know, playing like these small festivals in England um, that progressively get more and more packed. And, you know, you, you kind of see that moment of like where, where suddenly they're not a small band anymore. <laughs> like, yeah. um, and it's really, it's really just kind of a fascinating documentary. Um, plus just cool behind the scenes like stuff, but anyhow, it's a famous documentary called 1991, the year punk broke. So cool. That's why when you said 1991, I am weird and I draw associations with everything. <laughs> well, I'm super curious now, since you were into giant squids, how accurate or inaccurate that book is. I'm sure it's probably wildly inaccurate because that actually must have been written before the Colossal Squid. So giant squids are kind of cool, right? The mm -hmm. Colossal Squid is something to marvel at. Like, and I think they discovered, I forget when they f had the first Colossal Mike, do you remember? When so it was, it was uh, the Colossal Squid thing. Archetoothus ducks, a giant squid. So yeah, it's not a Colossus squid that the book is about. Well, I just remember it was in the news, I think in the early 2000s, like this Colossal Squid washed up on the shore and like, well, it didn't wash up on the shore. It like floated by a boat in Japan. Like, and it's so huge that the eye on the squid was yeah. the size of a dinner plate. Uh -huh. And so they had all these photos of them like dissecting the thing because it was dead. Yeah. And it, it like filled a room. It was so huge. Um, and the weird thing about a colossal squid is like on their tentacles, like I'm just going to go off about colossal squids because I just think they're awesome. Sounds but good. so they didn't realize they had grown to like this size. They knew they existed because there's these whales, like giant whales mm -hmm. have had markings that looked like a suction right and it would have like a circular cut around it right and they were like so there's like this weird animal that has suction cups that have like a knife or, or like a, a like a claw. tooth like a claw yeah. yeah but it has to rotate because it, it's a matching cut around the mm -hmm. <laughs> and so then they found out like this was like the first lives like like full specimen they found of it and they do actually have like so like two teeth like that so here's the suction cup and then it's two teeth and uh -huh. they just go like that like so they'll suction and just like saw you off <laughs> like it's kind of crazy um and uh they um yeah it was just fascinating because it kind of blew open the understanding of these animals because they also did a test to see how old the animal was and they found out it was a baby yeah, no, I, this sounds familiar. I wonder if this is all in the book. So this baby is actually like, I mean, you know, so they, they estimated that it's like one of the largest animals, if not the largest animal underwater is this giant colossal squid. Right. And it's big. It's f far out outsizes the, the um, giant squid. And so from that, I started thinking like how cool it was that like, you know, like, um, <coughs> like sailors used to tell stories about like whales that attacked people and people always thought that was insane until they found out that like killer whales, like 
actually eat meat right. and then they were like maybe <laughs> maybe maybe somebody actually got attacked by a whale <laughs> like maybe that's where it started um and sailors also had all these stories about giant like giant and colossal squids but like once you actually see the size of an actual colossal squid and the fact that they exist and they they mostly swim at lower depths like right. so that's why like no one has known about them except for like occasionally like a tentacle or something would like wash on shore yeah but like th that's why that was such a big discovery because it was like the first time like a full size you know specimen washed up Anyhow, I'm I'm gonna ramble. I'm gonna, I'll stop rambling about it. But it's just I got super fascinated by it. I just thought they were the coolest thing. The way they hunt is cool. It's like they actually eat <clears throat> giant squid, which is kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> so like, um, which is like a unique squid thing. I think squids are kind of cannibalistic sometimes. But yeah, it was um, it was just fascinating and cool. And I I, I actually like for a long time was just like. I don't know, wanting to like write a story about it. It'd be fun to do like a kid's book about a colossal squid or something. Dude, They're this, just so amazing. This is, this is a project you and I could collaborate on because I feel like our interests overlap a lot in a lot of areas, except for like books that we could do together. Dude, that's true. Maybe <laughs> I'll have to write like a colossal squid <laughs> squid right. story <laughs> and just be like, this is why colossal squids are awesome. And you as a kid should think they're the coolest animal in the ocean. I, it <clears throat> was just so fascinating to me that, um, no, the rotating knifey thing. So Eva was asking, do smaller squids do the weird rotating knifey thing? No, like no squids before ever did that like it from what i understand like that's what's so cool about this colossal squid like they kind of knew this thing existed they speculated they had no idea they were this huge and then like from this specimen like and then I, there were a couple more that like washed up in the it was all like within a certain amount of years but it's like yeah even the rotating like blade thing it's like a very unique colossal squid thing if you're ever bored just look up a colossal squid it's cool they have video of it too like of the guys doing the dissection and stuff and like i'm not kidding the eye of the squid is the size of a dinner plate i mean just to give you a perspective like if you think of a the eye of a squid in perspective of the squid it's usually not like a giant part of their head right right so you just <clears throat> take that you know on a on a giant squid i think the eye is like about this big like maybe a soda can so just blow that up to the proportion of like a giant dinner plate and you got this cool thing <laughs> the beast book is on amazon cool <clears throat> Ooh, the beast is now <clears throat> wow it's now available on video cassette i kind of want to i, I want to listen to this book though so you enjoyed it when you read it though i enjoyed it as a teenager Okay, do you remember the plot or it's just like, I don't know, it was cool? <laughs> yes, it was a very basic plot. Um, it was kind of almost what you described, except for <clears throat> it's like this kind of Bermuda Triangle area of the world and the ship gets sunk and kind of they can't figure out what's going on. And then when they find the ship, it's got these weird circular suction cup cuts on it. And, uh, and, and they, you know, hilarity ensues. I don't want to give it away because it's, it's a really simple plot. So there's, there's not much you can say about it other than I thought it was good, but I haven't read it in, you know, 25 years. So. Yeah. It's, it's hard with books like that. There's a, um, did you ever, I mean, I don't know. Did you ever get like heavy into like fantasy novels as a kid or. Or mostly um, like older. I was more into like spy novels as a kid, so like the Jason Bourne series before that got dumb. Okay, <clears throat> um, and a lot of like Ken Follett and and uh, uh, Robert Ludlum and a lot of that stuff. That's awesome, though. Um, yeah, because like I am curious. Um, there's a writer that like. And I've heard from other people. I didn't even realize this was like a common experience with people, you know. Um, but like a lot of geeks that I know 
um, in junior high were like really into this writer. And I didn't know anyone at the time I was reading him, you know, at my, at my, you know, junior high school or whatever that like were into this guy. Who is it? Um, so it's only the advent of the internet where I've been like, Oh, that wasn't like an unusual thing. Like a lot of <laughs> kids my age were like really into those books. Piers Anthony wrote this whole series of books called like the Xanth Chronicles or whatever. And oh, um, yeah. they're really like, I, I have these vague memories of it, but they're very fun books. And like, they, they're very like tongue in cheek fantasy. Like he, he wrote the books. I think he lived in Florida and even his fantasy maps are like a parody of Florida. <laughs> um <laughs> But like they're really fun and creative. Like I, I think one of the plots was like a kid, um, like he a kid is like uh he's he's really interested in like barbarians and reading about barbarians and stuff like that, and he has like he lives in a castle or something or not a castle I don't know he they moved to a castle something like that he's like in the normal world right, uh -huh. but he starts looking at this tapestry, and um he notices that there's like a spider on the tapestry and then some kind of magic happens and he gets sucked into the tapestry and is a barbarian in this fantasy world that was like depicted on the tapestry. Uh -huh. But also because there was a giant spider in there, like the spider also transports is like this giant spider. <laughs> oh, interesting. Who's like a sidekick character. So it's like this whole creative thing where it's like, and I can see why in junior high it was appealing, right? Because it's like the character is like a junior high kid who then inhabits the body of a barbarian, you know, and goes yeah. to this fantasy world. And like, of course, is like hitting on hot ladies. And, you know, it's like it's a I don't know, but it's exactly I'm, what I expected to happen at like 12 to 14 years old. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, if you got sucked into a fantasy environment where you know there's magic and all this stuff and you're a barbarian like what a, like of course right <laughs> yeah i'm not going to be like a you know like whenever i imagined those situations i never imagined that i'd be like a farming peasant yeah to totally I, this this is one of my uh one of my pet peeves with period dramas um which oh yeah no one's know, a surf. yeah well it's more just like and and keep keep in mind that I might or might not be working on a period drama in, in a little bit. So, you know, keep that in mind. But um, <laughs> so I don't hate period dramas. Like I, I really dig them. But the one thing that cracks me up about whenever, like a lot of women I know are obsessed with um, uh, not just women, like just people who are obsessed with like pride and prejudice and stuff. Yeah. They're always like, Oh, I'd be like the main character. And it's like, no, you don't understand. Like you wouldn't even be a servant in that house. <laughs> like, like yeah. this poor impoverished family. That's the main characters. They're like, they're like the very upper, like not even middle class. Like they're, they're like high upper, upper class, but they're just mm -hmm. like at the bottom of upper class. Oh, we only have four servants, you know, right. like, yeah, right. <laughs> Or like, oh, we have to tend to our own horses. Oh, poor us. And it's like, no, no, no. We'd be the person having to tend to the horse if we were lucky. Like, it yeah, transposed back in time, you know. Anyhow, I'm sorry. That's one of my pet peeves with those. <laughs> yep. Oh, um, let's see here. I think. Okay. Oh, um. Yeah, and uh, Frank was mentioning a spell for a chameleon, which is that plot I was talking about. That's the first in the Xanth. Um, and then the premise of Den by Richard Corbin. Yeah, I think it's like a similar premise, right? So it's an appealing premise for a kid, you know. But I've always wanted, anyhow. My point was, I, I've, I've, I've equally wondered if that holds up now, you know. Right. Because I really liked them. I bought a bunch of them, you know. Um, I still have them too as books, but it's like, I, I need to revisit those and see if they hold up, you know? So I read the born identity several times as a kid. It was my dad's favorite book. By the way, I actually like those. The first movie, first two movies were fun. Yeah. And if you call them sniper guy, they are excellent movies. Sniper um, guy. They are in no way, shape or form related to, the books at all they are so distantly related 
that it's almost offensive that that like this movie decided to use the name Jason Bourne because there are three similarities between the movies and the books. One is they have the word Jason Bourne in it. <laughs> Another one is that they have the word Treadstone in it. And a third one is that they have a highly skilled spy. So the memory loss thing wasn't in the Bourne books? Uh, yes, it was. I guess you could say. I mean, that's not like a unique plot device, like the special agent who's lost their memory, I think. Right. Been the used. way it happened was drastically different. And then the book does this, right? Here's what the book does. Uh, layer by layer, every few pages, the entire novel, something else is revealed to the main character and he thinks he's a completely different person and so the entire time he's wrestling with holy crap i'm evil oh holy crap i'm good holy crap i'm evil hunting good people holy crap i'm i'm good hunting evil people hunting good people like it's it just and you have no idea whether he's a good guy or a bad guy and every revelation that he comes to completely flips the script Mm. It is one of the most interesting, like, internal conflicts that I've read. And it still holds up? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, tried to, <laughs> I tried to read it again. <laughs> it That's so all. disappointing. I was really hoping you'd be like, yeah, it's incredible. I mean, I still think it's a really good book, but it is written in in a very older style and so it's like extremely slow like you've got to kind of let you can't you can't go into it expecting like you know a high-paced fast-moving story you got to go into it thinking like okay remember way back in the day when writers got paid by the word by magazines and you get like moby dick and you know the the uh uh the heart of darkness and stuff like that, you know, uh, it's that style of writing. So it is very good, but like I, I was, I had just read quite a few like really fast paced spy novels in a row when I was like, I should read Jason board again. And my wife tried to read it and she was just like, I can't, I can't do it. It's so slow. <laughs> Cause like, it starts yeah. out. But then again, him. Corey, you see, this may not be a bad thing because I'm the guy who like I like the ten panels in Jimmy Corrigan where he just wipes his nose. Okay. Of all I like slow paced. Of it's literally cool. of all the people I know, you might be the most likely to enjoy the morning. I'll it probably is. just be on the edge of my seat. Like this is so fast paced. This is so fast because I mean there's like several chapters about the doctor who finds him after he washes up with amnesia and it goes into like excruciating detail about like this doctor's background and like why he drinks and all this stuff. And in the movie, it's like, I'm a drunk doctor. Now you're saved. And then they just move on. <laughs> so anyway, do you, I, do you yeah. feel like um, just out of curiosity? Cause I, I, you know, have no idea cause I haven't read the books. Right. But the one thing that really I think is, important about those movies that I don't know if a lot of people remember when those came out that that movie I feel and this might be a false feeling but even at the time it felt like this like that movie changed car chase sequences like and fight scenes yeah yeah I feel like it was the way it was edited um prior to that they were starting to make things really fast paced but what the, what the problem was, especially in like a car chase or something, was like you would have like a depersonalization of the person in the car because it just became so high tech and ridiculous. Right. And that one really started bringing back like kind of like showing the the what's happening inside of the car, flashing between that and these insanely fast paced car sequences. So it's very personal uh, experience. And I, I rem just the way it was edited and cut was just very revolutionary, um, oh, yeah. as were, were the fight sequences, um, which is weird because Matt Damon's one of those actors I really want to hate, but I can't. <laughs> you want to, but it's hard. I have a list of like actors that I just I really want to dislike, and they're not bad. <laughs> Mine's Leonardo DiCaprio. I oh, yeah. He's top know. of the list for me.
and, I and, just, and he's I, and and he makes the least sense too because at least Damon has had some duds. Like I feel right. like DiCaprio has never been bad in a role. Like I don't think I've seen him suck. Yeah, but I want him to. I want to see him fail so bad. I think it was. I think it was in high school when he was like the height of his popularity. I I was like that guy. Like I think the smallest, tiniest cheerleader in school can beat the crap out of that guy. Like, why do girls like him? <laughs> I just couldn't figure out this, like, waif of a dude. <laughs> I was like, why? why and here that? I was a waify dude just being like, that guy's not a waify dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, He's no artist. And then I'm like, actually, he is. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> um, oh, man. I love that. All right. I got to see if. Yeah. Uh, this is good, man. I, I feel like I, I have made some. Uh, I'm really excited that we actually decided to do the stream because I feel like I've made some progress that mm -hmm. I otherwise might have zonked out for. So have you had, I mean, I feel like you have a million animals you're super geeked out about. Um, animals? Bugs, animals. You're very fascinated by bugs. Um. I yeah you know interestingly enough not eating bugs though that's that's, no, that's the realm that's, of Taraco um, Creative Cast yeah uh, interestingly enough I don't know much about bugs but I love looking at bugs and just like how they move and how they work is really fascinating like I have I don't know my, I'm not big but I have like stuff like this like I have like specimen encased in resin. And I use this as like photo reference when I want to like draw a face or something. Yeah, those are um, cool. Or a leg or whatever. Um, and I've got a few of those. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know a ton about them. Um, is there a specific like kind of animal you're like super obsessed with, where you're just like, this is like the coolest thing, or or have fallen down the rabbit hole of, like animal? Um, it's a good creature question. of the wild. Not and while really. you're thinking about that, uh, Philip said, I need to hit the sack. I wish I could stay, but it's 3 a.m. here. Philip, thank you for hanging with us. We appreciate it, man. Um, and yeah, dude, hit the sack if it's 3 a.m. That's that's early in the morning, sir. <laughs> <laughs> when, I right. was, uh, when I was growing up, vegans just annoyed the crap out of me because they were so like, they were like, they were like as as militant about veganism as like straight edge guys were about like straight edge. Yeah. And the funny thing is like um, that kind of thing, like even vegans I know that are like reasonable people yeah. hate those vegans. <laughs> right, <laughs> like right. the ones you're describing. Cause it's like, I, I don't know. It's like, uh, yeah, it's, it sucks when people are like overly. Yeah. When people about ruin, ruin good things. Anyone curious about uh, the the guy who supposedly who actually started Straight Edge, Ian Mackay, his take on Straight Edge? Just Google it on, on or YouTube it. He's got a lot of funly negative words about the Straight Edge movement. <laughs> so I I uh, I think I kind of like was very anti animal, uh, just as like a rebellious reaction to how annoying they were. Um, but I actually don't have anything against animals. I I like animals a lot. Um, but I've never like gone down the rabbit hole of that, you know. I, yeah, I was, I was always the the jerk that would try to say something to upset the vegans or whatever. Which is really common. My wife was a vegetarian for like the first few years, and and I will tell you, I got really sympathetic to what vegetarians have to put up with because like every time she'd mentioned she's a vegetarian you'd have people get super defensive immediately right. and they'd be like look i just eat meat because of it and she's like i don't care like you can eat yeah, meat. You're cool. yeah. and they're like no no i like i just want to give you like the justification it's like you don't have to justify it dude like I'm, no one's judging you and then it'd be like well what, what, what do you think about this well did you know that like blood like you know falls in the soil and like like you know plant like like bugs die and like that's in the plants and it's like i yeah but i just i don't eat meat that's all you know and i'd watch right. her go through this exchange i think i had that exchange with her too early on thinking it was unique and then after seeing that over and over again for many years it was like 
oh my gosh, like that's got to get so annoying <laughs> after yeah. a while. Just, I kind of am, I, I saw it from the other perspective a little bit too, where it's like. I tried to, I tried know. to never do that unless they came at me, you know. But yeah, if somebody gets all self-righteous about anything, it's it's hard not to want to. And if you're going to take gonna them down a peg about pure veganism, just like, I get it. I understand. Like, you know, I do actually think that like the meat conglomerate or whatever, I don't know what do you, whatever you want to call, like, you know, <laughs> that it's a, it's a problem for a number of reasons, you know, like, yeah, I mean, like conservation and there's, there's, yeah, there's some pretty decent arguments. Yeah. Factory farming is pretty hideous. Yeah. You know? It's, it's um, not great. Yeah. And like, it, it does suck when like people exploit something like as a meat eater, I do think there are ways it would be nice if we could find ways to like do it in a way that's like not painful to an animal, much like if you're like hunting an animal, don't shoot it like 20 times in areas that aren't going to just take it out. Like it's just kind of wasteful and stupid. People do that. Um, there are people who sport hunt and enjoy hurting animals and most hunters like most most legit hunters like hate them. <laughs> yeah. But I mean there are people who just, you know, have fun you know on the negative. Um right. you know, l- luckily not a lot of people I've met, which is good. But um but yeah, it's you know, but I but yeah, I agree with you like I think you know, don't I I feel like there's a i think being like that about anything can be really problematic you yeah know? i forgot how much fun it is to texturize the bumpy texture of tentacles tentacles can be fun it's just the challenge of the uh the curves on them and like like the challenge you were dealing with earlier of like which one remembering is which <laughs> right because if you get it off, it kind of looks off, you know? So it's like, yeah. I, which I, I think you've, you've managed to keep track of the curves of that. So that's cool. It looks good. I like the texture on that camera too. It kind of reminds me of like, um, oh, there's an art house style of like graphic designs that were done like toned. Ah, uh, I can't remember. Well, because I'm, because I'm trying to go fast, I'm breaking one of my rules and, uh, <laughs> I usually would would ink that myself, but that's just a Photoshop brush. Oh, breaking the law, breaking the law. Oh. Hey, um, you know, good on you. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. I think it's fine if people do that themselves, but like I have like a personal aversion to it in my own work. Um, but I don't know. Sometimes you want to finish something in an hour. Which oh, I'm then, not going to because we have three more minutes left. That's true. I, I actually should probably call it in a, at an hour. I'm actually, this might be the first stream where I ended in an hour. Although, man, I'm getting progress on this panel. See, this is a problem. I'll start doing these streams. <laughs> I know. And I'm Fair. like, I'm just going to go an hour. And then it's like, I start making progress. and It's like, uh, as soon as you say that, you hear the the narrator come in. He's not going to go an hour. Exactly. I, <laughs> I love that. Um, uh, so, uh, Jiz, uh, Dree Forev. Okay, so I think that might actually not have been a name I should read out loud. <laughs> All right. But, uh, but anyhow, um, on Twitch, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what the GZ Dree Dra, Dra Forever. Okay. Anyhow, so... He asked uh, if I meant cell shading. No, I wasn't thinking cell shading. I was thinking like the ink. Um, it's it's like a technique. It's almost like um, it, it's killing me, but it's like the pin something style from the 70s. They made these like art books. Push pin. That was it. Push pin graphics. It's got that vibe. Cool. I have no idea what you're talking about uh if you're ever bored google pushpin graphics it's like a it's like a a a style of shading that they would uh, implement a lot um but i'm glad i could remember that i don't know where that was housed in the back of my brain always always impressive that you can pull stuff like that out because i can never well, I, it'd be more impressive if I didn't have like 10 years of like, what was the, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I have to say, like, the the failure of memory to click into gear and just like like deliver what you need sometimes at least for me is just yeah. really frustrating i feel like you have a very strong memory uh um, for some things have you seen don hertzfield's world of tomorrow um you know i th- yeah, i think i think when was that when was this done uh, a couple of years ago, he just came out with a Kickstarter. Like, I, there was three episodes. I only saw the first episode, and then I backed it on Kickstarter, and it just showed up. Anyway, the second episode of that. No, actually, there's a behind-the-scenes animation of some of his animated characters, um, rambling about how memory is weird. And it is so. I, the whole time I was like, "This is this is right up Josh's alley." Anyway, if you get a chance, oh, you know what? I'll bring it since I'm going to California. I'll bring it, and we'll. Have All right, to you better bring it. <laughs> <laughs> if you're coming, you better bring it. You know, um, but uh, that sounds pretty awesome. Um, I'm gonna sneak away for two seconds because we're at the hour mark. I don't know if you want to hang for like a little bit longer, or if you want to call it. I'm kind of uh, cool with yeah, either. Yeah, I still want to get this done. So, because I'm shutting my computer down permanently after this. So, awesomeness. Okay, I I'm like uh, this is kind of crazy, but I I've like penciled like three, four panels so far. I'm on fourth panel, and I'm like halfway through it. So I'm like, I want to finish. Okay, um, I'll be right back, and uh, then yeah, we'll hang for a little longer. I also wanted to say thanks to everybody who's in the chats. And I also wanted to remind everybody we take super chats, which actually is a good way to support the channel. So uh, feel free to throw one on. Um, and whatever you say in a super chat, we will read out loud as long as it's uh, safe for work and all that kind of fun stuff. And if you're watching from Twitch, I don't think they have super chats. Sorry. No, but got, make sure you're got, subbed and all that fun stuff. They've got some way of doing something on Twitch. Yeah. But I don't know what it is. <laughs> we don't know twitch well enough yet but um <laughs> but anyhow i'll be right back uh if you guys are new to the stream too just so you know i usually at the hour mark take like a 20 second break so that's what i'm gonna go do and uh cory will keep you company so see you in a few why is that not drawing anymore i can't tell if my computer froze or something weird just happened there it is. It's back for no reason. Okay, actually, I'm going to take the opportunity to do the same thing and also go. I'm going to foam roll my back so that I don't die early. I will be back. So, I don't know if Corey took off. Corey might have taken off for a little bit, too. So, um, what I was going to say that I think is pretty rad um, is that I that I like about these live streams is there is an energy. And, and I, you know, I've gotten this, too. Like, when I think the first time I live streamed with other artists was with Jeff, like, who's in the chats. Um but what I noticed when I was doing it was like, it, it it's cool because it does have like a studio energy to it. Um, and it's not like an office energy, you know, like there is a vibe in an office when you have like a team working on stuff and you get a lot done. But like when you're just hanging out with friends and being creative and just like talking about weird, cool stuff, it like it really does make time go a lot quicker. And uh and like you do end up accomplishing a lot. So um, I, I just think, I don't know. I think like um, that that's something to be said because like before this, I had kind of penciled, I think like one panel um, when talking to, uh, to like Scott and Corey like on the live stream. And then like in this last live stream, I've managed to like blow through about 
three panels, which are simple panels, but still it's like, um, I appreciate you guys hanging in the chats and stuff because like it does, it, it's weird, but there's like a creative energy. I don't know if any of you guys get that, but it's like, I feel like there's a energy that happens. It's like really positive when you're uh, hanging with other creatives and just talking shop. Like it, it, half the time, just talking about like colossal squids or like, jason bourne novels you know like it's just kind of a, a fun uh fun thing did and you believe... ever did you talk did you ask answer this question about psychedelics uh what where is that question have you ever taken psychedelics to get inspiration for future pieces um okay psychedelic drugs i uh, first off, like I don't really use drugs anymore. I will drink beer occasionally and that's, that's about it. And I'm a very casual drinker. Like I don't drink a lot. Um, but I'll enjoy, you know, like having a beer, like a glass of whiskey here or there, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but like all of it within moderation, like, you know, to where if like, I told my doctor, like, they'd just be like, yeah, you're super healthy, you know, <laughs> like, um, but, uh, when I was younger, I was stupider and I did do ecstasy once and I, um, it wasn't, it's not necessarily a psychedelic. I don't know what it's categorized as, but I will tell you, um, it felt really good and I didn't get all frisky like a lot of people. Um, but it, it kind of scared me because it felt really good. And I was like, I don't think I want to do this a lot because I could see myself being like, this is the new thing, you know, <laughs> this is this is the new me. Um, but yeah, other than that, I didn't really do like a ton of psychedelics or anything. Um, I never really got into acid or anything like that because I knew people who did and it just didn't go well for them. Um, yeah. Uh, whereas like weed, you know, was something I did do a little bit in high school, actually quite a bit. And I, I don't know, like it, it didn't, I, n I never got hooked on it. Um, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, d no, I, I don't. Um, yeah. But you know, that's all past stuff. So, but yeah, yeah I, I don't uh, particularly like, yeah, I don't I, I I know some people are like really inspired by that stuff, but I also find like I'm a huge rock history nerd and it always kind of bums me out to see the guys who relied on that for inspiration and like a lot of them like later in life. <laughs> the only exceptions like if if there's a later in life for him. Yeah, the only exception I think to those stories that go tragic is like Lou Reed, which is like the weirdest story where he's just like the only guy I've ever read about who was just like, yeah, I did heroin for like five years. And then I was like, yeah, I'm going to stop. stop <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and it was just fine. I'm like that, that, that he's the one in a billion, you know, but like most people, most human beings don't respond well to like those, those things. And, and like, I had a really, I think the main reason I was turned off by like psychedelic stuff was I had a really close friend in high school who uh, kind of like started developing a lot of mental health uh, issues that were not there before. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm talking like, you know, seeing things, not being able to organize thoughts. Like he had kind of fried his brain uh, doing acid. And so like, that right. was a big to me, that was like a big warning sign where I was like, I don't want to be that guy. Like I, I saw somebody I really care about get pretty destroyed by that stuff. But again, I like, I, it's kind of like the vegan thing. I don't judge people if it doesn't, you know, if they're not hurting other human beings, um, you know, like for yeah. stuff, but, um, but it's just not my cup of tea, you know? Yeah. I, I kind of think I, I've never done it, any of it. Um, but I kind of think uh, it's one of those things where it's like you always get people that are like, no, it's fine. And I think it's fine for a lot of people. Um, but you don't know whether it's fine for you until you do it. And so it's a little bit of Russian roulette with your brain in, in my mind where it's like, you know, you, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I've, I've, never, I've never really done anything. Um, 
there's some interesting conversations around like microdosing mushrooms and stuff, but I just, I don't, my stuff is weird enough anyway. Like, yeah, I, yeah. Like, I, I was going to go there too. Like it's, it's hard to, um, it's, here's the thing. Like, first off, like, I don't really like, I, I need to be present to make art for me. Um, I like my, my problem is like, like I had this in grad school too. Like I, I had a, a classmate in graduate school who would have like four bottles of wine, you know, next to them. Um, and this is in grad school. So it's like, you know, obviously legal, right. <laughs> um, cause it's, it's in like the art studios that like the graduate students had on campus. And it's like, they'd have like four bottles of wine and like drink like three of them, like full bottles of wine and just do these brilliant paintings, like, like crazy, just dynamic, insane paintings. Whereas like for me, if I have like a glass of wine, I just kind of want to hang out with people and talk. Like I don't want to work on stuff. <laughs> like, um, And I kind of feel like that's, you have to be present when you're doing art. At least I do. And so like, I, I just don't think it's a good mix or doing I, I i just personally like i wouldn't advise it i definitely wouldn't be like down with my kid trying that stuff either so you know yeah yeah my my main thing is um I, i'm actually a really nice and optimistic person yeah like there's not a need to escape you know well but i mean but my art is really kind of dark and creepy and i i don't know that i want it to get worse <laughs> yeah know, like darker or creepier or weirder you know so but yeah i i don't know that's like, true too because like i i deal with like some pretty heavy um stuff yeah. in my books and like i i did have a friend uh who recently you know when when pot was legalized it's somebody that i i used to do that with as a teenager right it, uh. the, I'm telling you guys, this is like long ago, like th almost 30 years ago or something. Um, and they, when it was legalized, like tried it, um, you know, got like the prescription or whatever and, and like smoked out or whatever. And, and they, they're, they're a very similar personality to me where they're very introspective and uh, it, it just wrecked them for like eight hours. <laughs> because <laughs> they were just like they didn't have the whole like casual like oh i got sleepy and giggled and went you know like they had the like i'm such a piece of crap <laughs> like you know just the negative thoughts just like hit like hardcore for like eight straight hours and they were like yeah i don't think i'm ever gonna do that again like it's just not my thing you know yeah i don't think and, i want to give my anxiety any fuel yeah, I'm like, I already <laughs> deal with severe depression, so toying with anything like that, you know, like I already have a pretty good handle on that in my life, and I wouldn't want to do anything to like throw that off. And I, I frankly think we all have like our own kind of things, but well, it is an interesting question because I do really admire, like I love Jack Kerouac's writing, and that was drug-fueled, you know, like there's some really great art that was made fueled by that. But Josh, could you imagine the yeah. type of stories that I would write when, if I were like on something that made me more paranoid, I I feel like it would just <laughs> it wouldn't even be stories anymore. It would actually you'd become like the YouTube conspiracy blogger. <laughs> oh man! Yeah. But anyhow, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. I just like I, yeah. I don't know. Like if an artist were asking me for advice and they were like, "Should I do this for inspiration?" I'd probably just be like, "No, you should like show up like you know on time, do your art." Do the like study your craft and like <laughs> that's there's your inspiration but it is weird i mean I, i've read stories about the guys who wrote um one of the funniest ones i've read was like the guys who wrote doctor uh, not doctor who um doctor strange uh -huh. for marvel so like um ditko was like this very straight-laced guy right like very conservative very straight-laced and uh did not do any drugs right but he was drawing these like trippy. I mean, it's like what you're describing, Corey, where it's like you draw really crazy stuff already. Why do you need, you know? And yeah. if you look at like Dick Co. Doctor Strange panels, they're insane. Like it's it's like right. um, multiverses like folding into each other and stuff. Um, 
but then uh then like the t the two writers who were on staff writing it like there's these stories about them working at marvel and they get stuck on a story so they'd like do tabs of lsd and like walk out in the in the central park and come up with these crazy storylines for Doc, uh, Doctor Strange, and then come back and give them to Ditko, who'd just be like, "You guys are, <laughs> like, I hate you guys." <laughs> but they were these really trippy stories. So, um, I'm I'm not saying that to validate it because I kind of think in my in my head, my way of thinking about it is they probably would have done ten times more work and been more productive without it. That's that's yeah. usually my theory on it, you know. Like I, I imagine a world where like Kurt Cobain didn't get hooked on heroin, where he's still alive and you know knows his kid. Like that, that to me is like, I don't know. Anyhow, rambling. Yeah. And I know psychedelics aren't like as crazy as like heroin, you know. But, um, but still, you know, it's just not. Yeah. Okay. Different topic. <laughs> yeah, that was good. But I also try to be transparent about, you know, stuff I did do in my past because I don't want to, like, pretend I was, like, some saint, you know, because right. <laughs> I wasn't. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something about this color I don't like. What am I doing wrong here? Which uh, color? <clears throat> Just the tentacles. It's, like, too saturated. I gotta, I gotta knock it back a little bit here. You know what's great? That's the one area of red where you can mix like a compliment and knock it back, and and it'll be okay because it's gonna look kind of fishy. Um, right, right. That's like the one time where you don't have to use black to like darken your red. Yeah, I'm just gonna. Yeah, that's a really good point, Adam. That's a great quote. I like how Klaus put it. I don't want to relinquish my brain power to drugs. Yeah, exactly. I like thinking. <laughs> um, you know. Yeah. Gray this out. Don't don't do drugs, kids. Uh, I think uh, Frank just said. So this stream is demonetized, right? <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? Who knows anymore? At that point, we should just like show streams of every pop. I'm gonna show the Beast trailer. Is what I'm gonna do. The Beast trailer. The for the Giant Squid movie. Mm. All right, throw it on. <laughs> 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 well, wait, no, 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 don't, because I can't even look at it. That's the downside. Because I'm I'm uh, okay. finishing up this drawing. All right. Um, how are you making progress? Cause I think we're almost like in sync here. All I'm doing is like, I have to fill in a background. Um, yeah, I've just got to decide what I'm doing on colors here and I might. Have you thought about making it more of like a, uh, going like more of the territory of like a, a magenta? Maybe. Got I don't version. know. Cause I might like, especially against that blue, it might. Yeah, stand like a purpley magenta kind of thing. Yeah, I could do a little of that. I think my my problem is these are too powerful. I'm gonna knock those back a little bit. Frank was saying, just show the beast trailer. Okay, we're gonna watch that. I I think that should be our deal. Is like when when I wrap this panel, <laughs> <laughs> let's watch the uh, beast trailer. Sounds good. We'll do it. I hate everything I'm doing right now. None of this looks good. That's going to be the title of my biography. I hate everything I'm doing right now. None of this looks good. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty much almost every artist's biography. <laughs> where it's, um, why this looked so much better in my head. Right. Or the I could draw this yesterday. Why can't I draw this today? <laughs> you know, it's just like what happens so much that this sucks all of a sudden. Or then when you start working professionally, where you're just like, uh, okay, I guess I will figure out how to do this. <laughs> like yeah. I have no idea what I'm doing, but uh, you get more comfortable with that. Ugh, I hate all of this. All right, let's see here. 
Comic question. What does the term too much real estate mean and why is it bad? Um, okay. Maybe it, it can, that. Yeah, I was going to say you can use too much real estate in a million different terms. I mean, it just generally means you're just taking up too much space. Um, but it could be used in the terms of like, let's say you're using too much real estate for type. So if you have like a gig poster, right? A good example of this, there's an aesthetic that uses too much real estate for type, um, like those old 60s. This will tie into our conversation about psychedelics, right? Like those old psychedelic posters, right? Yeah. Right. Um, those are like the whole aesthetic of it is having the type take up too much real estate. Like it is just about the type. But there's a million like, especially like bad flyers for like clubs, you know, if you're ever walking in a city and you get handed like one of those, you know, I don't know, trance dance party flyers or whatever, you know, yeah. and you look on it and there's like 50 bands and it's too much text and it's taking up too much real estate on the flyer. Like what they should do is like isolate it, focus on some more aesthetically pleasing things, simplify the text. Right. Um but it, but Corey's right because it could be anything, right? You could, you could have like a, um, maybe your comic has too much real estate on a face, and it, like, and it's making all the panels on the page like microscopic, you know, <laughs> like, um, I don't know. It's hard to know. Yeah. So I mean, real estate in that context is just talking about like the space that you're using. Mm -hmm. And so in anywhere where you're talking about the amount of space, you know, that that's kind of what I think that would refer to. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I am not believing this, but I, I got four panels penciled between art casters in here. So nice. That's cool. That is way cool. I'm going to color this camera and be done. So. All right, so I'm gonna sneak out for two seconds while whilst you color the pan uh, the camera, and um, I am expecting we watch this trailer. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Good. We're gonna we're gonna see. This is the way that we play risks. It, you know, <laughs> at our age as as responsible parents, <laughs> our risky behavior is like. Let's play a trailer on live stream. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to break the law. Anyhow, so. Um, and then Frank was saying, so time for the beast. And, uh, and I was just saying, yes. Any moment now. When I was making the Captain Courage Christmas comic for 9 Volt Holiday, I used large panels and I was giving that critique. But I kept it. I liked how it looked. Got it. So maybe the panels were taking up too much real estate on the page. I don't know. Yeah, if you look at the entire page as real estate. Sticky Art asked, is this a collab? Well, it's a collaborative um, live stream, but no, like Corey and I are working on two separate projects. So the uh, the project that you're seeing most of is, is Corey right now. He's working on a camera with tentacles, which is kind of cool. It's like a camera squid. And I love that it's like got the Hasselblad kind of bottom that like it bottom loads like a Hasselblad. That's a, uh, it's a deep cut there for most people. I think. Yeah, that's it's right. Nice. Das Hasselblad that, that used to be the gold standard of like product photography cameras because it Is had it a blood, um, blood. Hasselblad, isn't it? I think it's blood. I just have always called it blot, but oh, okay. Um, but I think it is blood. But anyhow, it's like they had these um, negatives that were like the size of the back of the camera. Like there were these huge negatives. So you could get like insane detail. And back then, like the size of the negative actually made a really big difference with like what kind of level of detail you could produce in a photo studio. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I love it. Frank said, if you get demonetized, I'll super chat you next time. Okay. <laughs> we're going to hold you to that, Frank. Actually, um, yeah. But uh, no, we're going to do it. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to have risky, risky, crazy um, behavior by, by showing a trailer. Now, if you have, if you do get demonetized, 
you've got to um, you've got to fight that. Yeah, I, that I should. Me, yeah, there have been a couple, couple times, where it just wasn't worth it. Yeah, but I mean, it's happening a few times, and I just appeal it, and then they're like, "Oh, sorry, you can have it." Oh, okay. You gotta, gotta fight the gotta fight the uh, algorithm at any opportunity. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I guess, save but the I man, save the empire. See, for me, I'm picking my hills. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that idea, though. I, I should probably do it. it. Just seemed like more of a headache than it was worth. Than a lot of them. I just fill out a form and say, it's commentary. And then they're like, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sometimes there's stuff catches things. That's true. Well, it's mostly a bot that's catching it. And then when it gets to a human being, they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, Sticky Art said, oh, very cool, awesome details. I agree, Corey. It's, Thank you. It's looking good. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, I am trying to speed shade this thing, which is why it's starting to look like <laughs> but, uh, whatever. I don't know what I want to do with the lens. I know. I will just do some purples. Let's put some nasty purple gradients in there. And then we'll do some yellows and on the other side. Come on, give me some yellows. So I might just be an old dude or something, but I definitely am like more on the teetotaling end of things now. <laughs> I don't know what that life. is. It's the, it's the term they used to use like during abolition where it was like people who were like, all they would do is tea. Oh, that okay. was like the riskiest thing, you know? <laughs> and and like so all the like hardcore you know bar hoppers at the time would like call them teetotalers oh, that's so, funny. and i was reminded of it because i was coming up with co copy for uh, jacob's apartment and and we used the term teetotaler to describe jacob so yeah that's cool yeah that's all right <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool it's a cool term i like it it it, it feels like uh, oh my goodness frank See, that's going to get us demonetized right there. Is Frank saying, See, say no to tea? Like, you've just lost our entire European audience. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? We did throw that tea into the harbor. So, that's, speaking, that's of, speaking of tea, uh, Christian, who is on Artcasters, he has like an electric tea kettle in his, in his office. That's how British he is. Dude, I, I had forgotten how much the British drink tea and I was watching that uh, get back documentary, uh -huh. um, which is really great. If you're like a music nerd, it's kind of weird and interesting to see these guys just like disappear. And then the next day, like come with like the rough melody of what would become a classic, <laughs> like just, right. just spill out, like spill out of these jam sessions. It's kind of cool to see, but um, man, they're just drinking tea. Like it's like tea and toast is like oh, yeah. dropped off like that's their thing like throughout the entire practices it's like every five minutes it's like should we have some tea and toast <laughs> and like well and it's not they're like putting toast, jam like weird stuff on toast yeah yeah but beans definitely. on toast just baked beans mm -hmm. Mc, although uh, that i get the baked the baked beans on toast thing i get because that's kind of a, a poor man's way of growing up <laughs> like I, I definitely we did we did some beans on toast for sure yeah. Uh, Adam said, "Get back is great." Uh, if you are a hardcore Beatles fan or a musician, yeah, I just thought it was like inspiring, and it's also cool because it's enlightening. Like media cycles can t tend to like kind of glorify and like deify certain events, and it's interesting to see like a more real life version. So it's like, you know, the the press kind of made it out like as if there were like fist fights and stuff before they broke up. And that like Yoko was just like this horrible human being. And like, then you see it and it's just like a girlfriend hanging out at a practice and like human beings, like joking around with each other with like some much more subtle, mild tension. And I think like, I don't know. It's, it's interesting when, when, I don't know, I think they did a good job, like kind of humanizing it too. Um, because it definitely ran 
opposite from a lot of what I had understood happened toward the end. I don't know. Were you a Beatles dude at all? I like the Beatles. I don't. I don't think you could consider me a Beatles dude. A Beatles. My wife dude. is very into the Beatles, and I thought I had, you know, like a passing knowledge of the Beatles until I until I married her, and then I realized like I know nothing about the Beatles. <laughs> I I have had that happen so many times. I I felt like I understood a lot of books that my wife is a huge fan of. And then after she talked about it, I'd be like, I didn't know this book as well as I thought I did. Right. I don't know anything about this book anymore. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like I, I grew up like hearing a lot of their albums. And I remember Get Back and the White Album. And then like I, of course Sgt. Peppers, like those albums like kind of blew my mind when I first started them, you know. Yes, he never really had that experience. I liked him, but my dad was kind of into like late seventies punk, and you know. Yeah, see, I I had to discover a lot of the punk stuff on my own. My dad was like huge into like Simon and Garfunkel, you know. Which right. uh, to this day, I still have a soft spot for Simon and Garfunkel. Um, like on like on road trips, we would we would listen to like the Ramones and cheap trick way more than like the Beatles or, or yeah. Garfunkel or whatever. And yeah. Not, whereas my dad would also... do like deep cut jazz <laughs> 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 or like, or like the Beatles, like, cause I think they went through this phase where like, you know, they were kind of religious. Um, I mean, they were definitely religious, but they were like, a, kind of fell in line with a little bit of the satanic panic stuff. Yeah. Um I, I think pre satanic panic, but they kind of had like a freak out and like my dad like my dad had a classic collection of all the blue note jazz albums, which by the way, for anybody who collects vinyl, this story is going to destroy your mind. <laughs> he took them and trashed them because he was worried it was gonna like cause like deviation in his faith or something. Each blue note record, those LPs are worth something like two to six hundred dollars for a first pressing each like, like they're they're like insanely valuable albums um you know coltrane like all of these amazing albums and just trashed them um but then kind of like i think it was like a phase because like a few years later they were like oh we can listen to um albums again and stuff but like it was like the albums that we hear weren't like the fully like immersive like albums that they they had so it was mostly like stuff like like that um you know like dave brubeck and like stuff like that but my dad i think was slightly older than your dad too so yeah my dad was 55 born in 55 so yeah yeah but that's cool i your dad was a pretty hip dude rocking yep. out to uh that's strange. So, like, for you, when you hear punk rock, it's like you're like, "This is my dad's music." Oh, <laughs> no, I liked it, but like, my rebellion was like metal. You know, <laughs> like, I got into, I got into, uh, you know, Megadeth and Anthrax, and nice. I had a Sepultura album, but then I was like, I can't understand these guys. <laughs> <laughs> So Pulture is a bit too far. I was probably kind of a poser metalhead. Eh, we were we were all posers at one point in time. Right. The second you get into music, you're a poser. Like, and actually, people who use the word poser are probably the biggest posers. <laughs> they're, they're the worst offenders. Because I mean, if they're not even like if they're so concerned, I don't know. It's it's a weird thing. Because I can be a snob about stuff, but less so as I get older. You know. Yeah. Because I, I honestly feel like if people like something, there there are some, like, I will tell you, though, music is one of the few things where, like, I've had times where, like, um, I forget, we were, like, driving once, and somebody was listening to, like, alt country, and I had a physical revulsion yeah. to it. Like, I it, it it's hard to explain, but it's, like, I couldn't even focus or think, like, it was just, it was horror to hear to me. There is something about twangy country music that just i 
it like grates on the nerves so much. And I love like classic country, you know, like if we're talking like Johnny Cash or like Willie Nelson, you know, it's like I can rock that. Like, Can you so. even consider Johnny Cash country anymore, though? I feel like Johnny Cash is his own genre. Well, that's the thing. Country shouldn't be considered country. Like modern country, like neo country <laughs> should not be considered country. It's an insult to the term country music, which used to be good. <laughs> 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 but anyhow, yeah, so I get kind of snobby about music, but it's partially because there's just some like in general, I like most music, but there's some kind of music that like it just hits these horror show levels where it, it offends my senses, like worse than I can't think of like a, a lot of things that hit me like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. For my, me my, it's, uh... Frank said my rebellion was John Denver. <laughs> and then he said my, my mom wasn't against John Denver. So I guess I wasn't rebelling. Yeah. yeah. My, my first early rebellion was like Slayer. Cause like, Again, I said, you know, I kind of mentioned my, my parents weren't like hardcore falling for the satanic panic. They were fairly rational, but they kind of fell for it a little bit. Yeah. And um, so we were like restricted in like TV shows we could watch and like, you know, music we could uh, listen to and stuff like that. And so I remember the first time I got like a Slayer album, <laughs> I like hit it and like snuck it and then like listened to it like really low volume and uh and just felt like so freaked out like i was so worried because you know i you know i had sis older sisters who listen like the smiths and stuff but like slayer was like definitely one of those ones i think my parents would have been pissed about you know because yeah. like that was like the type of music they were like this is gonna open the portal, portal. to hell <laughs> and, and then your mind will be warped by demons and so i, I like i remember having this like physical fear this might be just like a growing up in a like christian school kind of scenario mm. but i had a physical fear when i pressed play i thought like what if this does <laughs> like actually like <laughs> you know i just thought like maybe the next day i would just be like making sacrifices <laughs> or something you know like it was um <laughs> But then there was this cool kind of rush to it too, because it was like breaking the law to listen to, you know. It was fun. Anyhow, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. All right. That's but crazy. Think... That, that's cool. That, it's kind of rad that your dad was into punk, though. Yeah. Because discovering punk for me was like one of the identity finding things for me. You know, yeah, my sisters really... were really into other stuff, but like punk was like my thing. You know, <laughs> like. I don't even think he would consider himself a punk, uh, you know, but he definitely didn't like what most people would consider classic rock as much as other things, you know, he yeah. like he heard some more fringe stuff. Yeah. I can kind of understand that. Like, I think being a kid in the nineties too, like, um, Cause there's a lot of classic rock that I like love now, but I used to avoid like the plague when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. um, like one, one of the key examples of like a stupid music snob mistake I made was I used to hate Led Zeppelin. Um, yeah. And the reason I hated Led Zeppelin was I was a kid who hadn't heard Led Zeppelin. I just knew the guys that, my high school who wore Led Zeppelin shirts and we didn't get along. <laughs> so, so I just made this assumption. I was like, well, they're into the grateful dead. I'm not super into the dead and Led Zeppelin. So I, I mean, it's gotta be that, you know, I'm not going to like Led Zeppelin. And then it turned out like, it was like when I was early in college, when I, when I first like put on a full Led Zeppelin album and I was like, I've made a huge mistake. <laughs> this is great music. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. Zeppelin's okay. I like I like some good Zeppelin, but not I don't know. Most most classic rock just drives me nuts in general. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. All My right. in laws are really into it, and I just I just can't I can't get there with them. Yeah, I'm. Okay, I think I'm mixed on it. I'm the mixed on it. <laughs> you see what I did there? <laughs> uh, let's see. 
if someone were to like go down a rabbit hole on Google looking for the mixed, <laughs> would they be able to find it? Uh, okay, maybe? so Colossal Squid Story has to happen, but the thing that has to happen now, Corey, are you done? Are you done with your Yeah, I think I'm piece? I think I'm just twiddling my thumbs at this point. Okay. I kind of so, want to darken some of the shadows, but yeah, I'm pretty much done. Okay, we have a trailer to show. Are you pulling it up? No, you're pulling it up because because uh, you know <laughs> you know uh, you know the live streaming stuff better than I do. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you you got to give me just a second. I don't have it ready to go. I thought you were doing. Um, uh, 1991, maybe? Oh, Adam made a good point. He said it's hard to imagine a general audience sitting through the whole thing. Yeah, I could understand that because it, it, I think it's mostly interesting because I've like been in those scenarios where you're sitting in a room full of people writing songs, you know? It, if it's almost like, you know how like Corey, you and I could like geek out watching like a crazy illustration tutorial. Yeah. But there's probably a lot of people who aren't like doing illustration. who would just be like, I don't know. I just kind of want to see the picture. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. um, it's like that. It's like the illustration tutorial, but the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Um, where's the link? Oh, Frank put it in chat. Oh, okay. The beast promo trailer. I can't click on that. Oh, another version of the beast. I, I think you might have to just cut right. and paste. Well, I can't because clicking on it in StreamYard just puts it on the screen. Hmm. Yeah, here we go. Okay, there we go. Holy crap. It's a minute and 40 seconds long. All right, one second. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is a trailer for the best new movie coming out this year. Okay, let me um, go. If you're just tuning in, this is like a <laughs> deep cut. Um, Share. Exclusive and trailer to this channel. Audio. And that one. Oh, man. Graves Point has always been a paradise, a vacationer's dream, until now. What was that? Oh man, I need to see this movie. <laughs> Imagine a squid with tentacles 30 feet long. Oh my god. So this thing has two whips. Those whips are covered with suction cups the size of this notebook. The squid grabs and impales its prey with those whips and drags it towards its beak, shredding the flesh as it goes. <laughs> Things built seven people in the last week. That's seven we know of. What are we waiting for? Clean ten minutes. They're in way over their head. Get out of the water! I keep seeing their faces. We're like blast beast out. You still don't understand what it is that we're up against. Get us out of here! <laughs> Did somebody just fall in the water and it exploded? <laughs> William Peterson, Karen Silas, Charles Martin Smith, and Larry Drake. Terror runs deep. From the author of Jaws, Peter Benchley is the beast. The beast? Oh, I'm sold, man. I want to watch that movie. <laughs> that looks hideous. <laughs> oh, I think you're muted, Corey. I said, I remember seeing the movie and it was so disappointing. Oh my gosh. But like, I kind of want to, I think you need to take a second crack. I think. <laughs> okay, Corey. If if I ever just need like a massive break from my project and you need a massive break from yours, what we should do is a live stream where we do live commentary over the entire movie. <laughs> MST3K it. <laughs> because 
<laughs> it looks really funny. <laughs> I mean, I was sold on like any movie where like there's a person holding the tentacle that, and like fake wrestling struggling. With I'm wrestling like, with this thing I'm shaking. Stop hitting me. Stop hitting me. It's so good. I also love that it's like in that in that era there was like a it's like a three and a half year period where like the most attractive actresses had like the butt chin, like the dimple in the chin. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and it's like, very everybody like everybody from like eighty-seven to ninety-one had like the butt chin. Well, I think it's because of uh, Cindy Crawford, right? Who was like she know. was all the rage at that time. That was Cindy Crawford was know. like the model that like every kid was obsessed with. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had like friends with Cindy Crawford posters in their room. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, oh, that's man. that was amazing. Um, the book. I remember the book being so good and then i watched the movie i was so excited that there was this movie coming out of this book that i had read i can't even remember when i read the book i was like oh that's amazing they made a movie of the book thing that i keep talking about this book with all my friends and nobody's ever heard of it now there's a movie and then i watched it and it was the worst piece of <laughs> <laughs> I was such a disappointed it's like you ruined it it's <laughs> Oh man! It's like if you want to see if you want to see the same experience that happened to my dad that I had with the Beast, you've got to watch the made-for-TV late '70s movie adaptation of Jason Bourne. It is. It's like it's it's got that kind of like '70s like buddy cop vibe to it. <laughs> it's it's oh. Awesome. I, I just wanted to mention, like, I'm not alone on this, like, Cindy Crawford memory because Adam was one of the guys who had a Cindy Crawford poster, and he said one of my first celebrity crushes. Yeah, I feel like it was like that era. Like, I think everybody was obsessed with Mar might might be a little pre Mariah Carey, but I think early Mariah Carey, everybody was obsessed with. <laughs> just remembering, like. Young kids and their obsessions. <laughs> it was a very strange time, but uh, who is the who is the girl who played uh, one of the first Bond villains with uh, Pierce Brosnan, or not Bond villains, uh, Bond girls? Oh and man, that's that? that's tough because I did, I'm not famil as familiar with Pierce Brosnan's uh, Bond. Um, okay, hold on, I'll find it. Her name is like something Christmas or something. Christmas. Um, My goodness. Not, not the not the actress, the the character, because it was a Bond character. Mm. Which, by the way, those books would be fun to kind of read. The Bond. Yeah, really? no, I I read like one, I think, but I'd I'd like to kind of rock some Ian Fleming and see. Are they any good? I mean, they seem like they'd be really corny, like in a really good way. They. I mean, I think Daniel Craig is actually a more accurate Bond than any of the other Bonds because they weren't really corny. He was like just a ruthlessly effective killer and womanizer who maybe like one slightly quippy line in like the whole book, but like he's not like this like live cracking joking clown guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I felt like Daniel Craig I, I mean, I haven't read the books, but I, I think Daniel Craig was an excellent Bond. Like, I just... Really yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. I think yeah, he, was, yeah. he was more novel accurate. Mm -hmm. Denise Richards is who I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Yep, that was one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she played... She played the least convincing nuclear physicist I've ever seen on the, on the big screen. Dude, um... I love it. So, uh, all There's right. Dr. Christmas Jones. That's, that's, <laughs> if you want to see some of the most mismatched casting, I think that it, I, I, I'm going to put this forward that has ever happened in Hollywood ever. Look at Denise Richards trying to say science words in that okay. movie. Um, what is it? The world is not enough. I think possibly one of the worst performances of ever. Like, there's, there is, I have nothing against her. I actually really liked her, but there is nothing that you could do to make her performance even remotely believable. Like she has never seen a textbook. I love it. 
Um, She's never been in the vicinity of a library. Just she. <laughs> and then they've got her. They're like deliver this line, and it's supposed to be like, I gotta find it. We should just watch that clip too. Anyway, dude, yeah. I I do want to watch that. I think this the beast thing. We have to make some kind of incentive to do. I don't know. We'll think of something, but it's like I do think that would be a good thing to kind of dangle as a possibility, where it's like, hey, we will watch the entire beast. <laughs> 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 and do commentary over it um but yeah that that trailer definitely was astounding and amazing and i th i think like I, I think if you're not sold on that movie there's something okay. wrong with you <laughs> um all right guys uh cory thanks for hanging out that looks rad dude thanks. um thanks for keeping me company whilst we were cartooning and drawing and uh and thanks to everybody in the chats who showed up um uh and then adam was saying you guys should do more clips in the future well we might have to do a whole live commentary <laughs> of like a bad <laughs> b movie <laughs> um, oh, man. i don't know I, when we'd find the time but i feel like we we should just pick a time like when you're on sabbatical and you're at this point on your project where you're like i can't see straight then we'll watch the beast. <laughs> Same here when I'm like juggling the two graphic novels and I'm just like, if I draw a picture right now, I'm going to lose my brain. Yeah. Then, then maybe that'll be the beast stream. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. That would be great. We should get Christian involved in that. Oh as, dude. As the film buff. Yeah. It'd be fun to get uh, him and, and we should definitely get Luhan too. Cause he'd yeah, Jim Luhan for... would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, I feel like that would end up just being Lou on and us laughing. <laughs> uh, Brianna is asking uh, if she came at the end again, and you did. You did, yes. Yeah. But we but, appreciate you being here anyway. And I will tell you, if you back up, like, I think it's like 10, 10 or 15 minutes, <laughs> you're going to see one of the best movie trailers known to Cinematic demand. masterpiece. Yeah, it's like a huge teaser for a one of the best movies you'll ever see. All right, same guys. Actor, same actors as the people that were in Jaws <laughs> and the same author of the book that Jaws was based on called The Beast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Filmed at about like an eighth of the quality. <laughs> <laughs> I, think they, I think they shot it. I think they so shot great. it on home VHS cameras. Yeah. And... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> One take There's sometimes episode. where you see the banding from the tape on the VHS. All right, <laughs> All right guys. Um, thank you to everybody who kept us company and, and hung out. And thanks for coming on the live stream. Uh, make sure you're subscribed. Uh, hit that bell. Hit hit the like button. And uh, make sure to leave a comment on what you thought think of The Beast if you're watching this after the fact. Um, and then also make sure you're subscribed to Corey. Uh on on youtube as well and and hit the bell on his channel and stuff because we're going to be doing a lot of streams like this and also Corey's now a member of the art casters too so like whenever we're doing art casters uh it's going to be on his channel like er every third time so uh yeah make sure you're subscribed there too anywhere else Corey, you want to send people uh you can see this posted on instagram in the next few minutes so go check that out Oh yeah, and uh, while you're at it, uh, check out my Instagram too, because that's where I'm gonna post uh, the <laughs> stuff I penciled. So, all right, guys, uh, have a good night. And that is looking really rad, Corey. Thanks. I like that touch on the eye. Really nice. All right. Yeah. All right, guys. Yeah. Uh, have a good night. Bye. Oh yeah. Before we go, sorry, I keep forgetting. Uh, Frank. Uh, Frank is our moderator on on my streams, and so I want uh, Frank. Did you already? Frank did drop a, a, a link in the chat, but also make sure you're following uh, Taraco Creative Cast too. So I, I want to remember to do that shout out as well at the end. All right, guys, have a good night. See you. <laughs>